Retaining and maximizing e-commerce margins by optimizing your warehouse and fulfillment strategy. That's a lot of words, but what does it really mean? Um, in the previous session or in the previous panel, there was a statement made by one of the panelists about decision making for profitability and so on. Um, everybody who's in here is probably lives and dies every day by trying to figure out how to maximize your margins by optimizing stuff. Um, but first, before we start, and I promise I'm, I'm going to cut off at 11.25, and you'll notice I'm a walker. I walk a little bit. I don't use a, a lectern and so on. Um, got to understand a little bit about me and some of my perspective um, and prejudices. So I've been in the transportation world for a really long time. Uh, I started my career with UPS in operations, finance and accounting systems. I went to a national courier company called CD&L. I was, and I was talking to the lady from Fresh Direct, I was the first vice president of transportation for Fresh Direct. Um, so if you'll excuse me, I really want to go listen to that presentation. We're done for today. Um, left Fresh Direct, I went to work for Granger. I left Granger, I went to work for a company called Amerisource Bergen. Left Amerisource Bergen, I went to work for this uh, toy company called Toys R Us. And in March of 2012, I was really tired of working for big companies. So I started a consulting business. And in that consulting business, I only wanted to work with small and medium-sized e-commerce companies where you could work directly with the owners and make decisions quickly. Now, for any of you that are with Fortune 50, Fortune 100, Fortune 250, quickly means like same day, not nine months, just to make sure everybody understands that. Um, boxed, first of all, by show of hands, who has the Boxed app on their phone? Okay, we're gonna take a minute now because I love to drive the data people crazy. Everybody take out your phone and download the app because all of a sudden we'll see 100 people downloading the app in the zip code. I'm not kidding, please take out your phone and download the app. You don't have to sign up to be a customer. Just download the app as I, I continue to talk. Um, who we are is we are the warehouse club on the web. So, it was kind of tough to see earlier. Um, what have we come across over the, the years? And I've been with Box for three years. One year as a consultant, a little over two years as an employee. We don't sell cardboard. We are Costco, Sam's, and BJ's without the perishables. So when you think about what we do, we try to do something where our value is to save the customer time and money. How many people here, A, belong to Costco, Sam's, or BJ's? How many of you enjoy spending time in their store on a Saturday or Sunday? Okay, you can leave. Um, <laughs> however, I'm a Sam's Club shopper. I actually like going into Sam's Club. Why? Because I can taste different things. I like the experience. Part of what we talked, or what was talked about in the earlier session is the customer experience. I love it. I like to go into Costco. But here's the example. Before Box came to be, when I was consulting and I would go into Sam's, I would be there for an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half, trying stuff, buying stuff. Now, when I go to Sam's, it's simply to get the produce, the meat, and so on. I'm in and out of there in 20 minutes. I get the rest of my product from box. Now, my stuff doesn't get delivered. I pick it up at our fulfillment center and I take it home. Okay, so it's a little bit different. So, so our goal, now, now here's another question. How many of you don't live within, say, a half hour of a warehouse club? So nobody from Harrisonville, Montana here, right? Where are you from, sir, if I may ask? Uh, Dutchess Gap, New York. Okay, okay. So, so limited, you can drive a little further if you like. So what we offer to our people or to our customers is the ability to save money, access to warehouse club stuff at warehouse club prices. So how do we do that? We don't have 30,000 SKUs. We don't have 100,000 SKUs. We have about 1,500 SKUs. So if you want toilet paper from us, and you go onto our web, and one of the things I will ask you to do so you learn about the experience, because we are tech-enabled grocery. And there were some com comments made earlier about technology. So grocery, right? Our business started in our CEO's garage, much like Mark Lore started diapers.com in his garage. He would go to the warehouse clubs and buy the product, bring it back, and ship it, right? You do that, you don't stay in business really long, because it costs a lot of money to do that. 
but we have some really great technology behind the customer experience with Star. So for those of you that downloaded the app at some point today, go play with the app. We have a hard gate on, I think, at this point in time, so you might have to give, give us some information, but this wasn't a way just to get more customers. It's a way for you to understand the experience. Most people that shop on Boxed never touch the search bar. And here's what happened. I talked about toilet paper. If you need toilet paper and you go to a site that exists today and you type in toilet paper, you get about 64 different options. You get the single roll, you get the four roll, you get the eight roll, you get the Scots, you get the Charmin, you get this, you get that. You go onto our site, you see three types of toilet paper. You see the Scott 36 roll, you see the Charmin 28 roll, and then you see our private label brand called Prince and Spring. That's it. We want customers to A, not have to spend a lot of time shopping for their necessities. We want to make it easy. And we ultimately want them to trust the offering that we have. The lady next door, um, speaking for Fresh Direct. When I was with Fresh Direct at the startup, the basic premise was, how do you get a New York consumer, because that's where the business started, to trust that the apples they order from you or the meat they get from you or the milk they get from you would be the same product they pick off the shelf at Dean and DeLuca, Gristie's, or whatever store they're shopping at. So it's all about trust and acquiring that customer. Um, we have no membership fee, and most orders, you know, if you think about those of you that shop at a warehouse club, think about how much you spend when you go there. So depending on what state you live in, you know, if you live in New York, you need $50 of an order for free shipping. If you live in Harrisonville, Montana, it's $90. Most orders end up shipping for free. That's the nature of the basket. As we look at some of the other details, what do we look like? Well, I like to say we're the atypical e-commerce company. Uh, in my former lives, you know, you, when you look at number of items per box, they're pretty small. You order from a toy company, you order from a department store, you order from a specialty retailer, you're ordering one, two, or three items. You know, maybe at Christmas time, if you're a seasonal company, your units per order go up, therefore your units per box go up. Well, this is what we look at. And some of the information I can share, it's been in public, um, I'll share. Our orders are about $100. And if you think about it, when you go to a warehouse club, you spend $100 plus your perishables. So we're close to the typical car. The average order consists of 10 items. And here's what I love. Here's what, what makes it exciting. We ship everything from paper towels to pita chips to pasta. How many people in here have ever ordered potato chips, pita chips, popcorn on the web? Why don't you? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, popcorn breaks a lot, just, just so you know. Um, but people do it, and that's our challenge. Our challenge as we look at what we're doing to grow is you know, you all read the, the periodicals, right? CPG is going to grow to a tremendous percentage over the next few years. So we, along with other folks, are trying to figure out how we get it to the customer, when they want it, in the shape that they want it. Um, we service all 48 states, and I say 48 plus two. We don't offer consumers in Alaska and Hawaii the ability to order from us, but we have a business partner that we supply product to. We have four distribution centers in the United States. One in Union, New Jersey, one in Las Vegas, Nevada, <clears throat> one in Atlanta, Georgia, and one in Dallas, Texas. And if you haven't read any press on us in the past two weeks, when you get a couple minutes, just type in box and automation. Um, a week ago, we turned on our new Union facility with some really cool automation, a cool mixture. Um, there's a lot of good press out there. So it gives you some good, interesting reading. I won't go through all of it now. Last year, we did $100 million in sales. For a business that started four years ago this September in the CEO's garage, that's a pretty interesting number. And we're growing very quickly. OK. I've been very transparent. As my wife says, I have no filter anymore when I speak. So when we talk about things in conferences like this, we tend to you know, try and talk about fancy ways to do things. I don't have an MBA from Stanford. I'm not from Columbia. I went to a state school in New Jersey, had the opportunity to go for a master's when I was at UPS, chose not to, having too much fun, regret it today. But let's talk about it. What, what are we sitting in this session for? Is 
we're trying to figure out how we improve margin, how we put more money in the bottom line to reinvest in the business to make the business bigger and better and get more customers. So here's some stupid numbers. Now, I will tell you, in a conference presentation I did somewhere in the last year, in reviewing the, the speaker comments, there was a comment by somebody that said I was, I was condescending. As I go through it, now, now does everybody understand what that means? Don't want to be kind of, <laughs> so sometimes I put up some simple, simple charts, and it's just, you know, to make it simple. So when we look at something, th these are made up numbers. If, if we have an order worth 100 bucks and there's $80 worth of, of goods in there, we have a gross margin of $20, uh, expenses, overhead, SG&A, warehouse costs, all that other crap, $15 leaves us $5 for the bottom line, right? It's not bad. So best is what? Everybody every day is going to an operator, a warehouse guy, a transportation guy saying, you need to cut your costs, you need to cut your costs, you need to cut your costs, right? Because that's the biggest thing you have control over. Well, I always like to say, yeah, that, that's a great thing. Can we raise the price a little bit? Can we buy it a little bit cheaper? So if you can raise the price, if your target audience can support that, and if you can buy it a little bit cheaper because now you're buying more, and your operators can, can you know, do what they need to do for expenses, you have the best of all scenarios, right? You raise the price by 2%. You cut your cost of goods sold by 5% or 6%, whatever that is. Huge gross, mar gross margin. You drop your expenses, now you have $16 to the bottom line. But how many merchandisers go out and say, yeah, I'm going to get it for a lot less? No, the, the response is the vendor won't sell it to us for any less. So we have to look at things. So what's a real solution, or what does it really look like? It comes up to the operators to cut cost. And how does that all happen? How do you improve margin? We talked about this, uh, Mike talked about it this morning, and, and we talked about the words process. And you talk about the words people, you talk about the word technology. How many of you guys use, and ladies, use Slack as an internal communication tool? Okay, so in Slack, now, up until five months ago, I had the honor of being the oldest person in the company. Um, five months ago, we brought somebody out of retirement. I'm no longer the oldest person in the company. But my emoji in Slack is dinosaur, okay? Because in some ways, I like to think of the old ways to do things. Process is always a start to everything, right? You have to have a good process. You have to have a well-thought-out process of what you want to do. Technology, and I consider myself fortunate because of the things I've done, I've been exposed to various technologies over the years, some that are you know, bleeding edge, leading edge, some that aren't really technology because if somebody has you know, one automated vehicle in a warehouse delivering product to the back, they say they have an automated facility. So you really have to watch the semantics. Um, but do you address it with people? Is it your product? Is it the guest experience? Or is it any of that stuff? What drives it? And this was kind of alluded to in the last panel. What's going to drive how you work on optimizing your warehouse and how you work on optimizing your transportation network? Because they do go hand in hand. So my specific role at Box and my title is Vice President of Transportation. I tell people that means trucks and stuff. I move stuff in and out. I have a peer that's fully responsible for what happens inside the four walls. But you know what? They work together no matter what. So when you look at this, what's going to drive the fulfillment strategy is going to allow you to drop more money to the bottom line. It starts with the business strategy. You know, there are a number of companies today, they take in money, and what is it? It's, it's drive the business, grow at all costs, spend $200 to acquire a customer, and let's hope we get bought up or, or something happens before we run out of money. Um, and I'll leave some editorials out of it. Is that what we want to do? Can we become a category killer? Or what Charles alluded to when we talk about making decisions in the operations is, are you going to grow? Now, I'm going to lump it in a growth at a controlled pace. He made a statement about um, growing at triple digits every year, but still making decisions around what's profitable and what's not to be there for many years to come. And if you notice, I put DHL ground up there. Back in 2003, DHL, who is one of the world leaders in international movement packages, decided they wanted a piece of the U.S. ground business. Anybody remember that? Was anybody, you know, somebody they approached? Okay. So somewhere around February 2003, they started going heavy, and they just wanted 3% of the market. They said, we're going to bundle it with air. 
Um, I think it was December 2003, they said, oh, this isn't going to work. We're giving away too much margin. And they backed out of the U.S. market. But, but that kind of says, you know, what are you doing? In your business, you know, rent the runway. Speed is critical to the customer. It's got to be there at a certain time. We ship 36 pack of Scott tissue. If somebody needs it within two hours, they're not waiting for us to get you know, there in two hours for, for toilet paper. We have a very different type of consumer. So speed in the network is not necessarily, it's gotta be there really fast. It's gotta be there when the customer expects it to be there. So our commitment to our customer from the 4DC network we have is if you order by five o'clock today, it ships then you're going to get it in either one day, two days. We have, we have a few three-day customers. So 92% of our customers receive their product in two days. Of those 92, 50% receive it in one day. And how did we do that? Well, think about where the four locations are. And most of our product goes out through a national carrier today. So is that your primary focus? Efficient fulfillment. If that's job one, you know what? You can be efficient at a dollar per unit fulfillment or you can be efficient at $8. So if you as an operator just go out and tell your teams, I want efficiency, I want it to be efficient, how are they gonna respond? They'll make the most efficient, may not be the most quality job. Your customers will always get the popcorn smashed. Um, the um, Keebler crackers will always come as Keebler crumbs at this point in time. So you have to be very clear in what you're looking to do. And there was a gentleman in this morning's first session um, very eloquently said he wanted the, I think, fastest, cheapest supply chain. But fastest and cheapest relative to what? To the folks on the Gartner Pyramid or relative to somebody else he knows? So what are you really trying to get to? But this is what's going to drive what you look to optimize in your warehouse and or your transportation network. You know, why technology? And that's a redundant slide up there. Technology allows you to do more with less. If you choose to go read the press that we put out, what you'll find is we've stated that we brought in some great automation, but nobody's going to lose their jobs. Why? We're in a, a growth span, a growth spurt. So we need the automation and we need the people. We're not displacing any people. And until we get to that growth, there may be some people that are trained in how to work on the bots or, or do some of the other work. But we're not losing anybody. But if you're in a mature business that's been plodding along and you're doing you know, three units a, an hour in your warehouse and you automate to reduce that or to improve your productivity, you're probably going to lose people, right? So automation works in, in both ways. In a growth environment, you do more with less. In a contracting environment, you can lose the people and you do more with less. But, but those are the keys. And why else? Competition. Competition is employing it. So, so in an e-commerce world, and I still say we're a startup, we're three and a half years old, almost four. Um, one of the things I've learned over the last four or five years dealing with e-commerce companies, investors who may not know the first thing about the nuts and bolts of the business, wow, um, first thing they ask is, well, this company does it, why don't you do it? So it's diligence on our part to ensure that we're using the right technology. I have to speed up a little bit. I, I didn't realize I was running so fast. Okay, technology, what kind? You know what? I get confused nowadays. There's pick to light, put to light, pick to voice, put to voice, A-frames if you're dealing with a lot of small stuff, goods to person, both vertical and horizontal. You know, when I think of horizontal goods to person, you know, what do you think of? Kiva, right? And then you have all kinds of other bastard solutions now. When I think of vertical, it's something that we implemented for one facet of our warehouse, which is OPEX Perfect Pick, which is kind of a, a real, I call it a closet on steroids. It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, goods to personal, it's not new. How many here ever worked for UPS? Did you work the preload? OK. Uh, yeah. UPS had these things, in, in a lot of, and they still have it called box lines. In 1980, I worked on a box line. That brought goods to me, and I stuck them on a truck. That's nothing new. It's just the way it's presented and the actual efficient utilization of that technology is relatively new. You have automated storage retrieval and robotics. That's really interesting the hell out of me today. How do you choose? This is how you really choose. I'm going to cut through a little bit. How you choose is, is these environments, right? 
you can talk to one person and they say, hey, I just implemented this solution by this integrator and it worked. But to the point that Mike from Gartner made this morning, is it going to be an apples to apples comparison if your profile is big boxes, heavy boxes, and the profile of the other customer is apparel in bags. So you need to talk and learn to the other, from the other folks that are attending these conferences. Gentleman asked a question this morning. He had a specific question he wanted answered. How is he going to find out? He wasn't sure. He was going to ask other people. And now there's a way to do a poll through Slido or whatever it's called, and I couldn't log on. So this is how you choose. But also, you choose by going to look at where it's been implemented. You choose to getting these people to come in and analyze your business with, as Charles would say, a very tight NDA, and being able to say, this is what we project for your business. This is what it's going to save you. This is what it's going to improve from a customer perspective and from a dollar perspective. Um, you know, start so, are your processes sound? You can't have a bad process and expect technology to fix that. Um, where are you in the business? You know, are you a growth company where it's acquire customers at all costs and put a thousand people in the business? Or do you really need to automate to gain capacity? That's where we were at. We're growing so fast and we need the automation to allow us to have the capacity to have a customer order by five o'clock and still get it out that day. That's what we're all about. And we'll tweak it as we go. So you make the process improvements in a manual environment. As a dinosaur, you know, to me, you can do a lot of stuff if you're here with a manual improvement, a process improvement. But once you get to that point, once you feel you're on par or you've gotten as far as you can, you then need to automate. Now, I'm going to have to go fast through this because I want to get to some transportation stuff at the end. Um, you know, you can take, you take each piece of your business, right? Everybody says it's a pick, pack, and ship business. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that, right? You have to receive the product. You have to put it away somewhere. You have to put it in the right location. You have to have enough in the right location. You then have to make it available to pick efficiently. Then you have to figure out how to pack it. Then ultimately you ship it. So the receiving process. Um, receiving some limited issues or, or some limited opportunities. There are these new cool trucks. I don't know if you guys have seen it, some trailers where basically it shakes some product out onto a belt. Um, if you're receiving a lot of parcel stuff, pretty cool stuff. If you haven't seen it, take a look at it. Um, you start with your receiving process. Picking, you know, what are you doing? You, you typically start as a discrete order picker. You pick an order, you, you move a card around a warehouse, you pick the order. Then you figure out how to batch it in a manual environment. Then you figure out how to bring goods to person. Why? The robots don't get tired, right? They don't call in sick, they improve. We expect a three to 400% improvement in productivity in our facility that we um, brought in the automation. So there are ways to improve that. Um, you know, bots, 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 you know, that's the internet, that's the supply chain of the future, right? The internet of things, robots that talk to each other, robots that now wind their way around the warehouse wall. Not as expensive if you haven't looked at it as you would think when you measured against productivity. Packing, here's the key. And even Amazon you know, goes out and tries to find people, that robotics that can solve the packing thing. Think about what we ship, paper towels to pita chips to pasta, including bottles of, of sauce and so on. You still need a human in some ways to figure out how it fits together. The density of a case of coconut water is about 60 pounds per cubic foot. The density of a bag of pita chips is about an ounce per cubic foot. How do you put that in the same box so it makes it to the customer in one piece? Simple solution, put in two boxes, right? Two boxes, right? We're out of business a week from now. Doesn't work. So the packing piece is, is that piece of automation. We do a lot internally. All of our software is proprietary, so we have a lot of aids and ways to help our packers in packing the product. Uh, but it's still a human element for the most part. Um, history lesson. How many people know what REA means relative to transportation? Anybody? One? OK. OK. Railway, Railway Express Agency. They were considered the UPS of their time. They folded somewhere in the 70s. OK. How many of you have heard of this company called Turvo? OK. 
So here's the interesting play, your homework for today. Go look at REA and see what happens to them. And then take a look at Turvo, who's a startup that just came out of stealth mode about five or six weeks ago. And you'll see what has happened in the transportation industry. You know, years ago, when I was with UPS a long, long time ago, zone two, one pound, $1.12, no accessorials, mission statement, best service, lowest rates, business to business primarily, maximum weight, 50 pounds, maximum length and girth, 108 inches. What were the other options to ship? Really nothing. There were a couple local companies that came around, but nothing major. So what does it look like today? Well, we have Amazon, right? Amazon has set the bar for the delivery of product. So when I think of Amazon as a brand, I'm not going to think about the private label they're introducing. I think of Amazon as I can go there, get pretty much anything I want, and depending on my needs, I could have it in two hours, I could have it the next day, or it might be two or three days depending on the product. So that's how I think of Amazon as the brand. So you, when you look at the transportation strategy to reduce cost and optimize, you got to figure out what, you know, how you put the puzzle pieces together to make it work. Okay? Do you need national coverage? Do you need regional coverage? Local coverage. Do you need to deliver to your customers five days a week, six days a week, or seven days a week? I, for one, am excited that UPS is finally really working on Saturday delivery and rolling it out. I'm excited that FedEx Home Delivery is trying to deliver on Mondays to residential locations. So we'll have two national carriers competing with the same base service offering. Then what am I worried about? I'm worried about the seventh day because I know some of my customers want their stuff on Sunday because they are home. They want to put the stuff away and they want to get ready for the week. Um, you know, we were talking about this before. Do you need overnight product? Do you need it two days, three days, same day or within hours? If you need my toilet paper within hours, I'm not the solution. I'm just not. But if you're having a party for the weekend and you don't have time to go out, I'm your solution. I delivered four or five boxes in my car a couple of weeks ago to a gentleman in northern New Jersey who was taking a bunch of Boy Scouts on a 100-mile, seven-day hike in West Point. He needed my stuff Saturday so he could prepare the kits for the kids. He needed my stuff. He needed it next day. He would have paid for next day. But out of the kindness of my heart, plus I was kind of curious as to what he was doing, I delivered it. How do you effectively put all this stuff together where it's optimized and it's cost effective? Well, you do it a lot of different ways. If you're a dinosaur, like me, you talk to a lot of people. What carriers are working for you? Kind of what are you paying? You know, what are you seeing? You use some of the new services that are out, the, the Narvars, the Get Conveys, and so on that have great information about what the carriers are doing. You got to realize one thing. Okay, years ago, the carrier perspective was all packages were good packages, right? Whether it was a, you know, half a cubic foot weighing 50 pounds or it was a lampshade. Carriers have gotten smarter over the years, right? Zone two, one pound today is $7.24 plus a thousand gazillion accessorials. So now all packages are good packages, but some are better than others. And the some are better than others are, where can they get more revenue from you, okay? So you need to educate yourselves, whether it's through peers that you would find in this room or using a good third party freight audit company that has knowledge, I, I can't name them, of what's happening in the marketplace to educate yourself. So if you need national parcel coverage or national parcel carry coverage, you kind of know what you're dealing with from a rate perspective. Because the bottom line is to get money to, the, to drop down there, you re need to reduce cost, right? Um, here's what I tell, you know, without knowing the, the profile of this room, what I've told all smaller companies over the last couple of years, you need to sell your business to the carrier. The carriers are seeing a lot of business go away. When I say go away, it's because of what Amazon's bringing in-house, but it's also because some businesses are just not as strong as they used to be. Um, you know, if you're a growing business, it's key. The carriers want somebody that will grow. If they're going to hook on with somebody who's, who's losing business, you don't get good rates. And remember, I, I've said this for 20 years now. Rates are relative to a geography and a point in time. Regardless of what the carriers say, if they've just lost business in a district, in a region, in an area, and they need business, you'll get lower rates that day than you would have gotten two months ago. You need to educate yourselves on 
how to deal with the carriers. Um, and we can't do this in you know, 25 minutes, it just doesn't happen. But these are some specifics where you have to educate yourself. And one of the gentlemen when I walked in said, um, okay, Box, teach us. I believe in student teach thyself. That's one of the reasons you come to this. You find out from the people that you're with. Here's the easy takeaways, right? Pass to margin improvement are many. Sometimes it's the littlest things. A penny here, I grew up at UPS, that's where I started my career. They taught me about cost control. If you carry that through your entire career, every single penny matters, regardless of what type of growth business you're in. Labor and transportation, right, in your P&L, what are the two highest cost items? And depending on your mix, labor first, transportation second, or transportation first, labor second. Um, I'm a dinosaur. Make sure your manual processes are optimized. That's a key element. Technology will improve your processes. That's all, you know, it's all inherent, right? And I'm not being condescending. Um, but what happens? You spend a lot of money to come here. There's a lot of people in this room that are going through the same trials and tribulations that everybody else is. They're willing to share and willing to help. You have to learn from each other. And it took me a long time to realize that because when I was younger, I always thought I always had the best rates or the best process. But there's always somebody that's doing something a little bit different, maybe a little bit better, that you can learn from. And typically, as long as you're not a direct competitor, people like to share knowledge.